بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعسومين المذلومين المنتخبين المنتجبين صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا نبي الله صلى الله عليك يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسع ويا باب نجاة الأمة ما خاب من تمسك بكم أمنا من لجأ والتجأ إليكم يا ليتنا كنا معكم سيدي فنفوز فوزا عظيما قال مولانا عبد عبد الله جعفر بن محمد الصادق صلوات الله وسلامه عليه السلام عليك يا وارث آدم صفوة الله صلوا على محمد وآل محمد A group of people leaving Medina wished to do the ziyara of Sayyid al-Shuhada سلام الله عليه At a time when no one had performed this ziyara before they entered into Karbala and they somehow found the grave of Sayyidu Shuhada without any markings there. And they stood there and they tried to pay their respects to Sayyidu Shuhada and they returned to Medina. And on returning to Medina, they met Imam al Sadiq and they said, Ya ibn Rasulillah, when we went to Karbala to perform the ziyarah of our master Sayyidu Shuhada, we didn't know what to recite. When I'm next to the feet of Hussein, when I'm next to Sadr al Hussein, when I'm next to Ra's al Hussein, when I come next to the Ard of Karbala and where he was killed, we don't know what to recite. And so, Ya ibn Rasulullah, give for us that which we can recite when we perform the ziyarah of Hussein. And in response, Imam Ja'far al Sadiq gave them what is known as a ziyarah al Mutlaqah. And the reason it was known was as as a ziyaratul mutlaqa is that this was that ziyarah that could be performed at any time of the year, at any date, in any occasion. Certain ziyarat we know are specific for certain times, even though they can be recited in other than those times. However, this was a ziyarah that was mutlaqa, can be recited at any point in time, at any place. If you wish to perform the ziyarah of my grandfather, do it in this way. And that ziyarah was the ziyarah known today as a ziyaratul waritha. And in this ziyarah, as we know, Imam al Sadiq begins. By addressing Sayyid al-Shuhada with some of the most interesting titles that Imam Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam has. For Imam al-Sadiq comes and says, Abu Abdullah is the inheritor of a number of different personalities. And I wish for us, in what is now the first night of Muharram technically, to look at the first statement of that ziyarah, where the Imam says, As-salamu alayka ya waritha adama safwatillah. That peace be upon you, O the one who was the inheritor of Adam, he who was chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the first thing, the first question that arises about this statement and about Ziyaratul Waritha in general is what was meant by this inheritance. 
For there was a group of people that came and said, a group of scholars that came and said, Al Murad min al Waratha wal Mirad fi Ziyara, what is being referred to by the inheritor of all of these is physical inheritance. For as we know, Anbiya and Ma'sumin that are mentioned in that Ziyara, part of the Ahlul Bayt also, had certain physical belongings in their life. And these physical belongings were those things that were inherited by Sayyid al-Shuhada. Adam والسلام, had certain scriptures that were revealed to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The shirt of Yusuf, which initially was the shirt of Adam, the staff of Musa, other scrolls and other sources of revelation. This is what was meant by the inheritor. And so when they said the inheritor of Nuh, there were certain physical possessions that Nabi Nuh والسلام, had that were given to Sayyid al-Shahada. Likewise, Musa al-Kaleem. Likewise, Ibrahim al-Khalil. This was one idea. And this was something that is accepted. In fact, we know today that Sahib al-Asri was zaman ajlillahu ta'ala farajuhu al-Sharif is in possession of all of those things that these other prophets of God had. However, others said no. What was meant by the mirath of Sayyid al-Shuhada from these individuals wasn't a physical mirath, wasn't something physical. Rather, all of these people that are mentioned in az ziyaratul waritha including the Ahlul Bayt, the Anbiya, all of these individuals had something, a shared quality, which was that which Hussein, salamullah alayhi, inherited. Why sometimes it's said, even in our uh, expressions and phrases, we say the son, methalan, has inherited his father's ilm. Or the father was a good poet, we say this was inherited by his son or his grandson. And so in the way that the word inheritance and mirath can be used for that which is physical mirath and inheritance can be used for that which isn't physical we can say that you have inherited certain qualities from that person they said all of these individuals in the ziyara had one common quality of course there are others but they said al murad for ziyara is this they said that was the quality of sabr and patience that all of these individuals mentioned in the ziyara were mountains of sabr and patience Throughout all that they went through in their lives, and Hussein Salamullah alayhi likewise was the epitome and the emblem of emblem of sabr in his life. And this is that which was inherited by Sayyid al-Shuhada. And so they said all of these statements: Adam, Nuh, Nabiullah, Musa, Kalimullah, Ibrahim, Khalilullah, all of these were referring to sabr which Hussein Salamullah alayhi inherited. If this has been understood, I wish for us to very briefly try and understand part of what the sabr of these individuals and the sabr of Sayyid al-Shuhada was. And this is through one of the very interesting narrations in regards to sabr and patience, as Shaheed al-Thani he mentions. He says there's a prophet of God. Now, as we know, Anbiya and Mursaleen, number one are of different levels. As Quran al-Kareem says, فَذَّلْنَا بَعْضَهُمْ عَلَىٰ بَعْضِ but also prophets of God have different roles in different societies. So there may be one prophet of God whose role is to bring down and he's part of the revelation of certain scripture. Another prophet of God, he himself isn't involved with revelation. Rather, he takes the scripture of a previous prophet, prophet of God and does tabligh and guides people using that scripture. Or there's a prophet of God that doesn't deal with these type of things. His sole job is to deal with what we call Raful Khusuma. Raful Khusuma is that there's a dispute between two people. They need to go to a judge. This prophet of God is placed, for example, for this town, for this city, and his role is Raful Khusuma. I'm the judge, you come to me. You bring your disputes, I say the haqq is with this person, and the other person is wrong. We're told there's a prophet of God, this was his role. His sole role that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed him, whether for this town or this city, is Raful Khusuma. I'm a Qadi, I'm a judge. Every day people come to him uh, and he deals with their disputes. We're told in the narration that this prophet of God goes through one of the most difficult trials and tribulations ever present on this dunya. For some of the riwayat say the most difficult or of the most difficult tribulations and trials and difficulties that a person can have in dunya 
is that they have a youthful son or daughter that dies in front of their eyes. This is one of the most difficult trials and tribulations. The father is alive, his youthful son or daughter, the body and corpse is in front of them. This prophet of God has a 16 year old son. The son dies in front of his eyes. Now this prophet of God is ma'soom. However, as I said, anbiya, mursaleen, ma'soomeen are of different levels. And we have those anbiya who are known as ulul azm, who had the highest level of patience. Ahlul bayt alayhim wasalam method and are those who have the highest level of patience. Other prophets of God had patience, but not the same level. This prophet of God, his level of patience, the riwayah says, wasn't like that of Methalan, Nuh, Ibrahim, etc. Like Ahlul Bayt. And so when he had this tragedy, what does he do? He closes his doors. He says, I can't greet people. I can't deal with people's disputes because of the shock that has taken place. And so for more than 40 days, his doors are closed. People are unable to come to deal with their disputes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wished to show this prophet of God what the true level of patience is that he should have. The level of those mentioned in the ziyarah. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides to send to him two angels in the form of human beings. This is something that we have that sometimes an angel can take the form of insan. We're told method and that Jibra'il on many occasions would be seen with Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Would be seen in, on many occasions in the form of a human being. And the people of Medina would recognize that this insan is Jibra'il. So this is possible that an angel would sometimes come in the form of a human being. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends two angels in the form of human beings to this prophet of God. They come, they knock on his door. He opens, he says, yes. They said, we heard that you are a prophet that deals with disputes. Is this correct? He said, yes, this is correct. I deal with disputes. They said, we have a dispute we have an issue between us that we wish for you to deal with an answer. Tell us who is right, who is wrong. So that prophet of God says, maybe you don't know that there's been a bereavement in my family. My son has passed away. And so I'm unable to do these issues for a while. I, I, I can't handle it. So they said, Ya Nabi Allah, we've come from very far. And they weren't lying. They came from the Samawat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We've come from very far. Please allow us to enter. So he said, no problem. They entered. They entered. He said, what is your issue? So one of them says, look, I have a farm. On my farm, there is growing vegetation. There is cattle. There are trees. There are crops. There are things that I grow as part of my livelihood. This person has cattle, has animals. Every single day, he takes his animals, his cattle. And they walk across my farm and they ruin and destroy a lot of my crops. They go and they come every single day. Why? Because he takes his animals to get water at a certain uh, lake or whatever it is at the other end. Every single day they go to get the water, they destroy some of my crops. They come back, they destroy some of my crops. This is a problem. So the Prophet of God thinks this is a simple issue. This person who has these animals is at fault. That you are destroying this person and going on to his property and going on to his property without his permission. The second person who has his animals, he said, Ya Nabi Allah, but first ask him, where has he placed his farm? Where is his farm located? He said, what do you mean? He said, there's only one way, one path to get to that watering source. And on this path, let's say the middle of the road, we have, for example, today a highway, a motorway, whatever it may be, one road, one path. That's where he's placed his farm. And so if this is the only way we can get to it, of course, the crops that he has are going to be destroyed because his farm is located in a place that cannot be safe. When this discussion has taken place, the Prophet of God says, you're right. O farmer, oh the one who owns these crops, when you first planted your seed in a place that's in the middle of the road, you should have known not to expect for it to remain. Not to expect for it to stay. Why? Because you've planted it in such a place 
The fact that you have planted it there, you should have known from the beginning that it would stay only a few days. And therefore you shouldn't be surprised when that which you have planted has been taken away from you. They said, Ya Nabi Allah, this is why we have come to you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, what do you mean? He said, in the way that anything that is planted in this farm, we know either it will be destroyed today or it will be destroyed tomorrow. Likewise, when you were given a son, where were you given a son? You were given a son in the dunya. And the dunya is like that farm, that which stays there, we know from the beginning. As soon as I came into this world, I realized that which comes in the dunya doesn't stay. Either it goes today or it shall go tomorrow. And so in the way that this person shouldn't be upset when his farm is destroyed, you shouldn't be upset when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you that ni'mah in this world and took it back away from you. This prophet of God then realized the lesson from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he reopened his doors. But he taught us one of the key levels of sabr is this. When you're given something and you realize that Allah gave you a ni'mah, Allah gave you a bounty and you thank him for this, but he gave you a bounty in this world. And that which comes in this world never remains. Either it goes tomorrow or it goes today. And that's why you find Sayyid al-Shuhada, salamullah alayhi, his patience reflected this. For he was given one of the greatest bounties. He's given a brother like Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, a son like Ali al-Akbar. But Sayyid al-Shuhada realized that I was given these bounties in this world. And they were an amana from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Either Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shall take them back today or shall take them back tomorrow. Which is why whenever I read these lines that are mentioned in, in the book of Maqtal, these lines are muhayyiratul uqul. They confuse a person. What lines? The lines that say the more bodies that Sayyid al-Shuhada salamullah alayhi picked up on that day. I.e. the more his gifts were taken back by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more we saw his tranquility on his face increased. Why? Because that which has been inherited by Sayyid al-Shuhada, according to the second opinion, was what? The sabr of all of these individuals. If these two things have been understood, physical mirath, physical inheritance, or in inheritance of patience, we come then to the third part. Which is that scholars came and said, no, it may be possible that these two things are intended. But a third thing that has been intended by Imam al-Sadiq salamullah alayhi, is that each of these great personalities, Adam, Nuh, Ibrahim, Musa, Isa, the Prophet of Islam, Amir al-Mu'mineen, al-Zahra salamullah alayhim, all of them had certain things in their lives which was reflected in the life of Hussein alayhi salam. And so go and look at each of these individuals, their lives, and see what was it that Sayyid al-Shuhada inherited. And our focus is on who? Adam, salamullah alayhi. For you'll find there are a number of things that took place in the life of Adam that were reflected in the life of Sayyid al-Shuhada. The first of these, and before I start this, please recite aloud salawat. Bismillah ar-Rahman. Salamullah alayhi. The first of these is we're told that Adam salamullah alayhi has nine prophets of God in his lineage, one after the other. And of these nine, the last of these nine prophets who were in the lineage of Adam had the longest of lives. وَمَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ فِي ذُرِّيَّةِ Adam, And there wasn't a prophet of God from these nine. Except that they would remind the people and their family members on his deathbed about the, uh, about the ninth. So the second in the progeny of Adam, Sheath, on his deathbed he would remind the people, don't forget the coming of the ninth. The third in the progeny likewise would remind the people, don't forget the coming of the ninth. The ninth was someone who had a very long life. His name was what? Nuh alayhi salam. That Nuh salamullah alayhi is the ninth in the lineage of Adam. He has the longest life out of all of the other nine. And all of them would tell their family members and followers on their deathbed, remember the coming of a time where from someone from our progeny shall save this world. Likewise, as we know, this was inherited by Hussein salamullah alayhi. That today, if you go into the shrine of Sayyid al-Shuhada, you will see in those lines written, of what Sayyid al-Shuhada was given, part of what he was given 
باي الله سبحانه وتعالى استجابة الدعاء تحت قبته والشفاء في تربته والأئمة في ذريته سيد الشهداء number one whoever does a dua under his dome their dua is answered number two shifa was placed in his turba and the turba of his grave number three aimma were placed in his durriya and so sayyid al-shuhada also inherited the fact that he has nine and the ninth in his lineage has the longest of lives compared to the others this was one thing a second thing that was inherited by sayyid al-shuhada from adam salamullah alayhi is that the narration say that adam alayhi salatu wasalam lived a very long life he lives a very long life on this earth until a time comes where the angel of death is sent to take the soul of Adam from his body. Now when this happens, Jibra'il is very worried. Why? The narration says Jibra'il wants to see what happens when a hujjah of Allah, a prophet of God, leaves this world. So we've seen, yes, when Habil died, Habil wasn't a prophet of God. So what is it like when Adam, who is a Nabi, who is a Safi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his soul is leaving his body. Jibrail is so worried, he comes down at that moment. He tells the angel of death, Ya Malak al Maut, be easy with Adam. He's the first prophet of God on this earth. Be easy with him when you take his soul. Then Jibrail goes to who? Goes to Adam, salamullah alayhi. He says, Ya Nabi Allah, Adam, how are you feeling at this time? And his response is that which we find also in the life of Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam. He says, the pain of death is such that it is preventing me from doing ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the way that is his worth. Meaning what? Meaning that even until his last moments, Adam salamullah alayhi in his heart has the love of worshipping his Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we find this to be inherited in the life of Hussein salamullah alayhi. For even in his last moments, he puts his hands to the sky and says, Ilahi anta waliyi fi kurbati. Or he places his head on sajda. He goes on to his right cheek and his left cheek. You can read in the books of Maqatil the supplications of Hussein, dua, ibadah of Hussein in his last moments. As we know in the night of Ashura, he spends reciting Quran and tahajjud and ibadah. This was something that was inherited from Adam salamullah alayhi. Adam, his body is leaving his soul. People are not in their senses when this happens, but he wishes to do ibadah and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, this reminds me of the fact that some of the uh, people of Arabic literature, they say one of the words for love in Arabic comes from a certain type of plant. And this plant attaches itself to the tree, to a certain tree, it attaches itself to the tree. And the effect that it has on that tree is it takes out all that is in the tree until the tree withers and dies. So what's the relationship between love and this plant that has a similar meaning? They said because this is the effect that love has on a person's heart. Their face becomes pale. They don't think about anything else other than their beloved. You see, for example, a person is mubtala. With love of something or someone, they become different. These awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this was their state with ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the way that their whole existence is taken over by nothing but the wish to place their head in sajda and prostrate in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This state of affairs of love is the ishq and the hub of ibadah that Sayyid al-Shuhada salamullahi alayhi inherited. This was number two. Number three, if you look at the life of Adam, and there are many, I'm just mentioning a few. If you look at the life of Adam, salamullah alayhi, we're told. And the Imma alayhi wa salatu wasalam narrate that Adam, when he passes away and is buried, and according to some uh, reports, he's buried uh, next to the grave of Amir al Mu'mineen, salamullah alayhi. Others say he's buried elsewhere. That's not important. What is important is that he's, he dies, he's buried. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals to one of the prophets of God, most likely Nuh, and says, look, I wish to send a message to shaitan. Which is what? Which is that when he had a chance to perform sajda and prostrate to Adam, prostration to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in front of Adam, and he didn't do so, and due to which he was accursed, due to which he was made to leave the heavenly abode or wherever he was, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishes to give, give, give him a second chance. The Prophet of God says, how? How can we give him a second chance? He says, tell him to go to the grave of Adam. And if he goes to the grave of Adam and does a sajda to me, sajda facing the qibla to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not to the grave of Adam, but next to the grave of Adam, if he does that, I will forgive his sins also. What he did, the mistake that he made, I shall forgive it. So this prophet of God, he sees shaitan. He says, I have a message from, for you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, what is it? He says, this. So what would the response of shaitan be? Shaitan says, I didn't perform prostration when he was alive. Do you think I'm going to perform prostration now that he's dead? When he was living and he was, hey, I didn't do that sajda. Now that he's buried six feet under the ground, you think I'm going to do that sajda now? Something else was inherited by Hussein alayhi salam, which was what? In the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told shaitan, the forgiveness of your sins is visiting the grave of Adam. We were told the forgiveness of our sins can be found in the ziyarah of Hussein alayhi salam. And in the way that shaitan was against the ziyarah of a hujjah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we understood that if someone is against the ziyarah of Sayyid al-Shuhada or the ziyarah of Anbiya and A'imma, they follow the seerah of who? They follow the seerah of shaitan. For shaitan is that person that believes that an infallible is dead, even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says they are living. If you look at the riwayat that speak about the ziyarah of Hussein salamullah alayhi, Ibn Fahd al-Hilli, he quotes from some of the Qudama, he says, that Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq is unwell, and we have a number of riwayat that are similar to this. Imam al-Sadiq is unwell, and he tells a person who is close to him and his family, he tells him, go and tell an individual on my behalf to go and perform the ziyarah of Hussein salam for me, so that I can gain shifa. Go and take someone, employ him, give him money, tell him to go to the grave of Sayyid al-Shuhada and do ziyarah on my behalf. And so the person goes, he tells a certain individual, can you go to Karbala and do the ziyarah on behalf of Imam al-Sadiq sallallahu alayhi? At first he says, no problem. Then he says the same thing that you are thinking. Who's the one asking for this? Imam al-Masoom. Hujjah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he came and said, I'll perform it. But in the way that As-Sadiq salam, in the way that Sayyid al-Shuhada is Imamun Muftarad al-Ta'a, is a Hujjah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so is Imam As-Sadiq salamullah alayhi. He doesn't need for someone to go and perform the ziyarah on his behalf so that he gains shifa. So they came back and they told this to Imam As-Sadiq salamullah alayhi. He says, of course I know this. I am Hujjah of Allah, as is my grandfather Hussein. But there are certain places on this earth that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made places of barakah and the answering of to us. And of them is the grave of Sayyid al-Shuhada. I wish to show those people. Imam Sadr can do dua and gain shifa. I wish to show them the greatness of the ziyarah of Hussein alayhi salam. And so this was another thing that was inherited. I'm being asked by the brothers at the back if people can please... Uh, do some, make some effort and uh, move one or two steps forward. Rahimallahu man dhakar al qa'im min al Muhammad. Please recite a second salawat. The third for the love of Sahib al Asri was Zaman. Once these three things have been understood of the mirath, I wish to focus on the fourth. That there are these things that Sayyid al-Shuhada has taken or are found in the life of Adam and in the life of Hussein salamullah alayhi. But the fourth is what? The fourth is that when Habil is killed by Qabil, the riwayat say that Imam uh, Nabi Adam salamullah alayhi spends his days and nights crying. However, Jibra'il comes down to him. Jibra'il... Tells him the story of Sayyid al-Shuhada in the way that you lost your youthful son. 
the grandson of the Prophet of Islam shall lose his son Ali al Akbar. Nabi Adam sallallahu alayhi cries and laments for the tragedy of Hussein sallallahu alayhi hearing it and then as a gift for what was taken away from Adam sallallahu alayhi Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives Adam alayhi salatu wa salam another son by the name of Hibatullah Sheath. Now there are two people called Hibatullah both during the time of Adam. One of them is the son of Adam by the name of Sheath sallallahu alayhi. And so Ali, uh, one son was taken away, Habi. Instead of that, another son is given. And Sheath is that son of Adam alayhi salatu was salam who carries on the line of Isma and infallibility. Likewise, we find this to be inherited by who? Sayyid al-Shuhada sallallahu alayhi. The Ali al-Akbar alayhi salatu was salam is taken away from him. His other children are taken away from him. But in the way that sheath was a gift to Adam sallallahu alayhi. And he was the one that continued the line of Nubuwa. Sayyid al-Sajideen sallallahu alayhi was a gift to Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And he was the one that continued this line of a'imma and isma. And you find a number of similarities between the relationship between Adam and sheath and Imam Hussein and his son Zainul Abidin Like what? Like of the similarities we find between these two groups of people is that during that time we're told it was very clear in the eyes of the people that sheath is the hujja of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There was no doubt that the best son of Adam is him. And there were qualities found within sheath that made it very apparent that the nur, that the nur of Nubuwa is on his shoulders. Likewise, you find in the life of Zainul Abidin Salamullah Ali, that after the death and the killing of Sayyid al-Shuhada, it became very clear. Read the history and you'll understand what I'm saying. It became very clear that the hujja of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Imam Zainul Abidin. And there were certain qualities found within him that showed to people that the nur of Imam is on his shoulders. Let me give you one example. Sheikh Abbas Qumi and others, they narrate that on one occasion a person comes to the house of the holy Imam, Imam Zainul Abidin. He comes, he knocks on the door. One of the servants opens, he says, I wish to see Ali ibn al Hussein. One of the great qualities of their imma is that it's very easy to see them. It wasn't that I go to see him and he's busy and come back 20 minutes later. People often have this arrogance. I get a certain position. You want to see me? Write this down, write that down, call that person, and maybe I'll see you in two weeks. A imma, ahlul bayt, infallibles, one of their qualities was this they're the hujja of Allah. They're the best of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation. You can go on their doorstep and meet them. He says, I went, I asked to see the Imam. I came in. The Imam says, how can I help you? He says, Ya ibn Rasulullah, I'm in dire need for 400 dinar. The riwayah says, when he said, I'm in dire need for 400 dinar, the riwayah says, the Imam began to cry. He began to cry. So the person says, Ya ibn Rasulullah, have, have I said something uh, Offensive to you? Why are you crying? He says, the reason that I cry is that a mu'min has asked me for a certain thing and there is not even one dinar in all of my house. The reason I cry and what breaks my heart is the mu'min asked me for a certain thing and I can't answer him. Don't underestimate and undervalue the importance of answering a mu'min when they ask you for something. If you are able to fulfill the request, the halal request of a mu'min, this is one of your obligations. And this is one of the source of barakah in your life. And if you are able to answer the request of a mu'min, a believer comes and says, I need something from you. And you don't answer it, even though you are able to, then beware. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may make a person go through certain trials and tribulations for not answering a mu'min. This is the haq of the believer. The imam says, I cry because there's nothing in my house. The only thing I have are two loaves of bread. However, the riwayah says, the imam says, but these two loaves of bread can be eaten by no one else other than me. You've heard, for example, in the life of Amir al-Mu'mineen, there were certain things he ate that no one would be able to eat. Imam Zayn al-Abideen says, they will be of no use to you, but this is the only thing I have, I give them to you. 
He gave this person the two loaves of bread. The person is happy with what he's been given and he leaves. People in Medina heard this. They began speaking about Imam Zainul Abideen. Saying what? People often have these areas of confusion. This should answer a lot of those areas of confusion. This hadith. They said, if he is a hujjah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if he is an imam, representative of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, couldn't he just have prayed to Allah? Couldn't he just have done dua and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have somehow sent 400 dinar? They call themselves, this is what they said. They call themselves representatives of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then all he can give him is two loaves of bread. The person says, I took these two loaves of bread and it was close to the time of ghurub, maghrib. He says, I went to the marketplace to see, is there anything I can exchange for? And I saw that the, the shops are about to close. And there is a person who has a few fish left. This fish he had from the morning, he sells fish. He's got one, two fish that have been left out there in the sun all day. No one wishes to have anything to do with them. So I came and I said, look, your fish, they don't look very inviting. And this loaf of bread that I have isn't that inviting. Do you swap this for that? And his mind is what? Well, at least I can feed something to my children. He says, yes, of course, no problem. No one's going to buy this from me. Take it. So he says, I gave him that loaf of bread and he gave me this fish. Then I carried on forth. I saw someone has a bit of salt left that he was selling. Who's going to buy this salt at the, the end of the day? I said, maybe I can put this salt and fish together and maybe something can go in the stomach of my children. So I told this person, if I give you this loaf of bread, will you exchange it? He says, yes, no problem. He says, I entered into my house. I started cleaning the fish. Now there's a fiqhi issue that I'm not going to go into, but sometimes you'll see what happens here. Sometimes uh, this is the case. What is the case? He says, I cleaned the fish. And as I cleaned it, I found inside of it two diamonds. The fiqhi issue here is who do those two diamonds belong to? Sometimes it belongs to the person that caught the fish. Sometimes it's the one who found it. This is another issue that I'm not going to bore you with. In this case, it belonged to him. It was his haqq. So as soon as he finds that, he takes it out and he says, Sallallahu alayka ya ibn Rasulillah. That this is what you gave me. This is the barakah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has answered my dua. What is interesting is what the riwayah says after this. He says, he took out these two diamonds inside the stomach of the fish. He thanks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a knock on the door. Who's there? The person who was selling the fish. He said, we took this home. We realized that this is of no benefit. So I realize what difficult state you must have been in. That you have nothing but this. I thought, take this with you. You keep it. No one's going to eat this. He says, no problem. A second knock on the door, who was it? The seller of salt. He said, we took this home. No one's going to eat this in our household. You keep it. It must be that you're going through a very difficult situation. So he's thinking now these two loaves of bread are here. The imam has answered my dua with these two diamonds. There's a third knock on the door. The riwayah says a servant from the house of Imam Sajjad comes, knocks on the door. He says, yes. He says, the son of Zahra has said, now that your dua has been answered, can he have his loaves of bread back? Why? Because as he said, no one can eat these but the son of Zahra. He says, he took them. It goes back to the house. The same people that spoke previously against the imam. Now they realize the status of the Ahlul Bayt. And then they said, Look at how great the Ahlul Bayt السلام, are, that in their fingertips is all of this world. However, they choose as this is the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to live in this difficulty. This is the will of Allah, so the Imam stays with only two loaves of bread, even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers his du'as. So there were certain qualities found in Imam Zainul Abidin, especially after Ashura, if you read, that made it very clear that he's the hujjah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the way that there were certain qualities in Hibatullah sheath. The second thing between these two and Imam Hussein and Adam is that in his last moments, Adam alayhi, is about to leave this world. He tells sheath, he said, when I used to be in the gardens of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before I came onto this earth, I used to taste from the fruits of, this, of those gardens. And I wish for my soul and my body to be at ease in my last moments. Can you go and find some of those fruits? Fruits from Jannah. So Sheath says, oh my father, how will I find for you fruits from Jannah? 
Where will I find these fruits from Jannah? So he says, look, go to one of these mountains surrounding this area. And I'm, you will see an, an, an angel from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Seems that he had this ilm of what is going to happen. Ask him to bring some fruits from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's gardens and paradise. So the narration says, Sheath alayhi salatu was salam goes. And as he goes to these mountainous regions around where Adam salamullah Ali is about to die, the angels come to him and say, Peace be upon you, O Sheaf, the son of Adam. He says, Why? He says, Don't you know? Your father has just died. Your father has just left this world. Upon hearing this sheath then rushes to the body of his father. Have you seen the comparison? That sheath Hibatullah couldn't be next to his father in his last moments. Likewise, Zainul Abideen was unable to be next to Hussein ibn Ali when Hussein's soul was leaving this bo his body. Jibra'il comes, Mikail comes, the other angels come. They say, Sheath, you need to give ghusl and kafan and recite the salatul mayyit of your father. And Sheath would do so after which he would begin to cry and lament. Tears would roll down his eyes. He would say, wa asafa. To which Jibra'il would give him condolences for the death of his father. Likewise, I have read those narrations. That after Hussein salamullah alayhi is buried by his son Zainul Abideen. The grief that overcame Imam Zainul Abideen. أَمَّا الدُّنْيَا فَبَعْدَكَ مُظْلِمٌ وَأَمَّا الْآخِرَ فَبِنُورِ وَجْهِكَ مُشْرِقًا And I've read those riwayat for we're told when Sheath after Adam alayhi salatu was salam leaves this world, Qabil comes to Sheath. Qabil says, I killed your brother because I saw within him good qualities and I was jealous of him. I find within you even better qualities. I'm even more jealous with, uh, with you. And so Sheath spends his years doing tabliq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but without being so much in the public eye. Zainul Abideen, salamullah alayhi, likewise. If you read, he lives on the outskirts of Medina. He does his tabliq. He takes people towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but he's not in front of the public eye. And he would often leave. We have those narrations where him and Imam al-Baqir would leave. Just them. Just the two of them. And they go to the grave of Amir al-Mu'mineen. And he recites the ziyarah of his grandfather. And he goes to the grave of Hussein salamullah alayhi. And this is a source of solace for the heart of Zainul Abideen. Sheath, you spent your years crying for your father. How did Zainul Abideen salamullah alayhi mourn for Sayyid al-Shuhada? For we're told in a narration mentioned by Shaykh al saduq in his Khisal, Imam al-Baqir says that there are certain people known as Bakka. Five people. Bakka refers to those that cried extensively. Who are those five individuals? Imam al-Baqir Salamullah alayhi says min al-Bakka was Adam Safiullah that when Habil was taken from him Adam would cry for 40 days and 40 nights until Jibra'il would say you cry in regards to your tragedy but the grandson of Rasulullah shall have a tragedy that is even more difficult he says and min al -Bakka was Nabi Yaqub when he was separated from his son Yusuf and he would become blind crying for Yusuf he says and the third min al was Yusuf who would cry in the prisons Yusuf crying for the separation from his father. He says, and the fourth that would cry extensively is the one that when they would wish to pray, one hand would be on the wall, the other would be on her broken ribs, and she would say, Mada ala man shamma turba ahmadiyin. And la yashom, does the man.
الأيمان غواليا صبت على الأيام سرنا لياليا She says the fourth of the Bakkaun was my grandmother Fatima to Zahra He says and the fifth was my father Zainul Abidin For he would cry and lament and remember his father Hussein We're told he would pass by the streets of Medina He would see the butcher has kept his meat that has been slaughtered He would stop and say let me ask you three questions before I go any further they would say yes ibn rasulullah ask us he said when you kill this animal did you give it any water and when you were slaughtering this animal were the family members of this animal watching and when your knife was on the neck of this animal did you speed up the killing or slow down the he says, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, I gave it water. I hid the animal away from the others and I sped up the killing. He said, Hussein was killed thirsty while Zainab and Ummul Kulthum would be watching. And when Shimar's knife was on the neck of Hussein, he didn't speed up the killing. <laughs> Rather, he slowed down the killing of my father. Whenever he would see things like this, he would remember his father Hussein. In fact, even in his last moments, for we're told that a time would come where the soul of Imam Zainul Abideen is about to leave his body. He's on his deathbed. Imam Al Baqir said, I would be hugging my father when suddenly Zainul Abideen looked at me. He said, Oh, Ba. I have two final requests. He says, the first is place my body on the ground. The second is come off my chest. Imam al-Baqir immediately places his father on the ground. He comes on the, off the chest of his father. He says, Ya Abata, can I ask the reason for these two requests? He said, I thought I am on my deathbed but my father in his last moments his body was on the ground of Karbala therefore place me on the ground like my father and what about the second reason he said I was thinking in my last moments on my chest is my son but on his last moments Shimr Jalison Allah Sandra. Allah la Anatullah. Halal Kaum in the Limin was Sayalam Ladin Adalamu. I am on Kalabinian Kalibun Ilahi Bil Hussein Il Waji Wajadihi Wa Abi Wa Ummihi Wa Ahi Wa Tis Atil Masumi Namendurieti Wa Bani Ekhirli Aulia Ina Wa Kufana Ada Ana واشغل هم عن أذانا وأذهر كلمة الحق وجعلها العليا وأجهد كلمة الباطل وجعلها السفلى إنك على كل شيء قدير وصل الله على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين